Welcome to the System Simplified Podcast, where we feature top leaders who share stories on how to successfully systemize a business. Now, let's get started with the show. Hello, Adik Levitt here with the System Simplified Podcast, where we interview top entrepreneurs, founders, and thought leaders about systematizing a business. And this podcast is being brought to you by Business Success Consulting Group. At Business Success Consulting Group, we create custom processes and tailor-made business systems so businesses can thrive and grow. All right, and today's guest is Joel Greenwald, the founder and managing partner of Greenwald Duharty LLP from New York, but it's a national employment law company that actually represents the own the employer side. So Joel and Joel so good to have you here. Well, thank you for having me. Great to be here. Yeah, absolutely. You know, Joel, you are a renowned speaker. You've spoken for many associations and many groups. I know you are you speak for Vistage and other groups and you've been doing it for a very long time. You litigated and been in arbitration and mediation and you are like the expert in employment law. Well, yeah, I mean, I, we, we're not supposed to use that word expert ethically, but I guess I've been at it long enough. Hopefully I've picked up some things. Okay, good. Well, I said it, not you. So yeah, that's correct. That's correct. So I'm not denying it, but thank you for saying it. That's right. You can. Okay. Okay. You're very welcome. So, you know, one of the things that are really unique about your firm is that you use a subscription model for employers for for your clients to use so they can actually have access to you right because it's so important to actually have access to your employment lawyers so you don't start going oh well if i'm calling my lawyer it will take me you know this is going to cost me five minutes right so it's kind of like open the door for the people to actually be engaged with you and your team and utilize your services tell me yeah. more about that subscription model well, thank you. It's not something that a lot of law firms do. Uh, some other forms of professional services organizations do, but law firms typically are married to the billable hour. And, you know, we just decided about six or seven years ago that it just, we needed another, another way because we found that we were constantly getting called after the fact. People were looking things up on Google, getting them wrong. And that, you know, frankly, it, it, it's, not always even the best thing from the service provider's end to bill by the hour. So we came up with a subscription model um, and a healthy number of our clients an increasing number of our clients um, on the advice and counsel side. In fact, most of them now are using uh, the subscription model. And frankly, um, we're delighted. I think the clients are delighted. Um, we're always trying to get it even better. But the idea is, is that we're really not billing anybody by the hour in that model and they're calling us and they're calling us in advance. We're actually having set calls with them um, on a regular basis, making sure that they just, you know, that, that, that nothing is really left to complete chance, that they're calling us and trying to mitigate the circumstances before they get out of control. Yeah, I think it's I think it's great. And that's what we're going to talk about today. You know, this podcast is all about systems and our listeners are listening to learn more about systems and how to simplify their systems. So I interviewed several people in terms of the HR system, in terms of recruiting and in terms of onboarding. But I would like to talk with you today about the importance of HR systems and any advice that you have of different things that have to be part as part of your systems for every business so that you can actually stay out of trouble, you know, mitigate risk and still do business, right? And not be so... Uh, blocked or um, have constrictions that you can do business, right? That's why you- I, mean, I, I, yeah. I think the key thing in, 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 in employment law is that for the most part, let me just explain that, you know, when we're talking about uh, discrimination or terminations, for example, let's just say that where people always say, well, they were, I was unlawfully terminated. Well, the termination is not a breach of an, a recognized contract, but most, most of them aren't the lawsuits or legal liability and exposure for companies really comes from um, discrimination. Okay, so if the company is accused uh, and successfully found to be liable for discrimination and the termination was motivated by some discriminatory animus, such as, you know, 
uh, you know, they were pregnant or, or, or they were a different race or, 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 or the employee was a different religion or a different age or, or, or whatever it may be. But that was part of um, uh, what, what motivated the company to take their action against one of these protected classes. That's really the biggest problem for companies in that regard. So one of the things I like about companies systemizing things more than anything else is that I think that if you're putting things in a systematic way and you're doing things that the same way for all different employees, you're mitigating your discrimination. Because you know, if I'm treating the men and the women the same way, I'm treating older people and younger people the same way, people of different religions the same way, for the most part, you know, that's going to go a long way. So the more things are systemized in terms of discipline, in terms of performance appraisals, in terms of all sorts of performance management, I think the better off you are. Absolutely. You know, sometimes start working with clients and they get overwhelmed by, or they were overwhelmed before they come and work with me, right? So then I'm trying to sort out where do we start? Because it's overwhelming to start documenting everything. So my advice is also always, let's look at what are the major components in the company that if you had well-documented processes and procedures, you'll get the biggest return. We'll do that first and then we'll move on. So from your perspective, what are the main things that every company should, should document in terms of employment, in terms of HR? Well, that's a, it's a good question. Well, first of all, there, there, are, there are some of the starting documents, some of the hiring documents, there are potentially termination documents. And, the, and those things are often regulated, at least on the hiring side, by statute, they're state specific, that matters. Um, you know, from a termination standpoint, uh, I'll get to that in a second. But the, one of the focuses that I care about a lot and I'm really passionate about is that managers who really are your lifeblood at executing all this stuff, okay, are usually not very well trained on how to document things, okay? We give managers a paper trail training, teaching them how to document effectively. Um, because from my, my perspective, um, documentation um, on employee performance rarely happens in real time. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of different things that, or methodologies that I think employers could use. One such methodology is to make sure that uh, managers are tracking um, any sort of feedback they're giving to employees on a regular basis. Maybe not giving it to them, but whether it's on an HRIS system or it's in, in a notebook in their, in their desk, it's potentially discoverable, but they're, you know, told them they did a good job, told them that they, they filed the report late, told them and give a date to it. Because then at a certain point in time, presumably a manager um, should sit down with an employee and say, all right, we need to have a discussion about this. This has gone on, this is, I told you about this on April 15th, I told you about this on May 1st, I told you about this on June 29th, um, and now I'm telling you it again, this has got to improve and such and such and such. And presumably um, uh, there's a document and it could be in the form of an email or something to that effect that goes back to the employee, okay? That, that basically captures the draft of, 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 of what was said. And potentially if there is pushback on some things, put those in the document. Very often, I like to think of it like, that the manager should almost create a draft of what they're gonna say at that meeting in advance um, and potentially review it with HR. No, nothing wrong with ever doing that. Make sure HR, uh, make, you know, that the conversation doesn't run afoul of any laws because the managers sometimes don't know. Um, and then have a conversation, really give the person a chance to speak, um, but go through the litany of things that they've done that are causing concern and, and, and the improvements that you expect. And, and, and then, you know, presumably you drafted an outline of it, you're having this conversation there, and then you're putting the words on paper in a way that brings it to life and potentially makes the employee aware of the fact that they've got to improve these things. These can't happen. And this is very fluid. It happens all the time. It shouldn't be something where you wait on an annual basis to do a performance evaluation. You're doing this regularly. Managers need to understand that that feedback is helpful to them because if they want to fire somebody and there's no documentation. That's problematic, you know, and, and, and there's a whole host of other reasons too. I mean, not notwithstanding the fact that maybe the person actually does improve. Sometimes people don't hear you. When you put something in writing, they actually listen. 
in a certain way, or they, they, they internalize it is a better way of putting it. So I think that what's very, very important from my perspective is getting documentation woven in to the DNA and how the operation runs. Love it. That's a great process right there on how to document and when to document. And so you also recommend documenting the good things. If I have an employee that is doing improving or doing a good job, I should actually put it in writing that they're doing a good job. Why not? Why not? And you know what? Nothing wrong with actually saying, listen, you know, we're, we want to give you a gift certificate for this because you really improved to go out to dinner this weekend or something like that. This is great stuff. I mean, those little gestures go such a long way. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I agree with you. Documentation is a big pro. It's, it's good to have a documented process on how to do documentation and train the managers. And I know that's something that um, you can help your, 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 your firm helps with. Right. So it's actually because you don't you don't invent like and I think a lot of it is um, the fear paralyzes a lot of employers from what I can see from my clients is they don't know if it, what they're doing is correct or not. And sometimes they choose to do nothing, which is the wrong thing to do. Anytime to do nothing is the wrong thing to do, right? Yeah. So, you know, during the pandemic, what we did was we used to do, I, I, I do a lot of the training in the organization myself. Um, I, I really don't litigate anymore, but my lawyers that work with me and my partners, they litigate plenty. Uh, training is a passion for me. And during the pandemic, one of the things that I had to do was the trainings were moving towards Zoom and virtual. And <clears throat> I, often I used to train companies by giving them scenarios and having them act them out, the managers. And um, that was hard to do through Zoom. So what I ended up doing was getting a, um, some Broadway actors that were out of work to act out some of my vignettes. And I got up 30 of them so far pre-recorded and edited. And then we show the vignettes to the managers now over Zoom. And uh, we go into breakout rooms to discuss them. And then we go into a collective discussion to discuss them. And I love it. I think they love it. It's honestly, the pandemic's been, uh, you know, on, on that front has been an eye opener that there's just so many different ways now that we can reach people in mass. That is incredible. So how do we, how can, I want to watch those things. So how, how can you um, do that? Do you have to, is it, do you have it on the internet that somebody can pay a subscription fee or how, how does it, how do no, we access a, it? That's a live training. It's a, you know, that we, 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 we it's, a, it's a live training program. There's a, the key component to that is a lawyer like myself is facilitating the discussion, really saying, hey, let's look at this vignette. You know, what are we learning from there? What did the manager do right? What did they do wrong? I want you guys to talk amongst yourselves. Sometimes we have groups of HR people from different companies. Sometimes we have managers from the same company. But either way, we're really enjoying the process now of them looking at it through these breakout rooms. Then we have a general discussion. And usually, like I said, there's some really good insight. But ultimately, there's some teaching moments for us to teach people, but in a more dynamic way than just lecturing. Absolutely. So why would companies go and decide to take that training? Is it usually, is it preventative or is it after something happens and they realize that they have a flaw there or something is? Please let it be preventative. Let it be preventative. It should yeah. be preventative. That's the way. I mean, yeah, there are certainly companies that know, recognize they have a problem, but there's companies, you know, certainly our subscription clients are doing that kind of training all the time. We've got loads of different trainings that were, uh, constantly uh, creating through this new methodology. And, and frankly, it's, um, it's really, really enjoyable not to have it so that the training is pre-recorded. It's really not. Just those little clips are pre-recorded, but the discussion itself is, is, is live and interactive because, uh, you know, I, I'm, not, I'm not a, you know, we certainly uh, understand the need sometimes, but from, to have pre-recorded trainings, but for managers themselves, I'd rather them enter into a dynamic framework with people that know how to lead those discussions. Absolutely. So what's the, um, what's the name of that course or that training? Like how, what's the overall theme? Well, we have a few, we have a, we have a few different ones, but they're, they're all management trainings and, um, you know, documentation oriented training. There's a, a, an anti-harassment training. There's an anti-discrimination and accommodation training. So understanding the laws of discrimination, reasonable accommodation. Um, we're, we're completing a workshop on legal issues and hiring, all using those Broadway acted vignettes as kind of the anchor for this. That's incredible. So if people want to know more about it and they want to sign up for that training, where should they go? How do they reach you? 
Um, listen, please call me if you want, 212-644-1310 uh, or jg at greenwaldllp.com. Um, and I'm lo I love talking about it because it's, it's become an amazing passion for me. So I Absolutely. love it. Absolutely. Yeah, you know, that's, that's what we have in common is like that passion for training. That's why I like documenting, but not only the documentation of, I'm talking about overall processes, right? But also the training of those processes and imparting that knowledge to new employees to on, when you onboard, train existing employees, um, et cetera. But this is, takes it to a whole different level because it trains the managers, the HR, definitely the HR personnel and the managers, like how to, how to create that culture and how to treat the employees correctly, which I think it's amazing. It's absolutely and, incredible. And also how to communicate effectively with HR, how to communicate effectively with employees working below them in, in, in my world. And, and so to me, the documentation training is really my favorite one because I think that that's the biggest gap. You know, I, I think that employers don't know how to, don't know how to, um, for the most part, document employee performance correctly. Absolutely. And we all hear about it afterwards. I mean, you know, that is if you have documentation, it can save you, it can prevent different things. And I mean, I noticed that from working with clients, they just have a back off of documenting some things. I, I, and do you know why? I mean, what is your theory? Why? Well, you, you could say some bad things in documentation if you don't know how to do it. I mean, you could easily say things I've, I, I, I've seen before clients say things that are discriminatory itself within the documentation and that's really a negative thing so you don't want that by any means either so there's there's a you know there there's an understanding that you can't say things that could give rise to discrimination in the documentation plus the fact that i think the main reason companies don't document on these issues is they don't want the confrontation and the managers are afraid of a confrontation and they think you know i have a hard enough job as it is the last thing i need is that but i think if anything um it's really the only way to get employees to correctly improve their performance. Correct. And it's, uh, it's really depends on the culture of the company. If it's a culture of openness, it's a culture of communication. If really people have that as a core value, but really live up to it and not just a core value is written somewhere. That's part of it. It's really the open communication, the, um, truth, you know, honesty, integrity. I mean, that people really like to put us to their core values. This is where it comes to life, right? Because we um, are able to have that communication. I couldn't be a bigger believer in core values and that values are probably the best way to document poor behaviors. Mm -hmm. of because a lot of times it's not skills that are causing problems with employees, but their behaviors. And if their behaviors are at odds with your values, it creates some measuring stick or some tools with which to do something. That's true because you, you basically say it ahead of time, you know, mm -hmm. you're coming to work for this company, we value, let's say our, one of our core values is being um, persistent, you know, but I'm asking you to, I mean, you've been asked to do something and you just quit, somebody quits on it and they go, well, what's wrong with that? Well, you know, we are one of our core values is persistence. I know it's just a right. simple <laughs> example, but, but then they don't align with it, with the policy of the organization of what they already know that is expected, right? Well, I mean, listen, the, the thing is that I think you touched upon it. Core values can't just be something that's written on the wall. They've got to be part of the DNA of the company. They've right. got to be integrated and woven in. And honestly, if you're going to performance manage off of them, maybe even ultimately discipline and fire off of them, they should be business centric. Talk about consistency and the need for systems. You know, I don't want you evaluating certain people based on values and not others. But, you know, there's, you know, I would certainly talk to counsel before you just elect to fire somebody based on transgression of values. But, you know, values can play an important role in how employees are managed. So Joel, you know, in the last uh, year and a half, we've seen a lot of changes in the workplace because of the pandemic. You know, the pandemic forced us to work from home, um, deal with different issues that we didn't think we need to deal with. What are the biggest um, problems or issues that you see employers dealing with right now because of that change? Well, I think that, that it's really tough for employers to manage employees effectively remotely. It's not something that they've figured out so well. And I think that that's a challenge in a big, big way. 
And I, and I, and I think that performance management was always difficult, even in people working together. But I've seen, um, you know, you talked about the fact that employers uh, shy away from doing that. Well, I think it's easier to shy away from that when you're not even in the same vicinity. And it's hard to have those kinds of conversations via Zoom, you know, sometimes with, with, with employees. And I think that they don't know if somebody's family member is in the living room with them. So they're reluctant to say certain things. You know, that's really, really a challenge for companies. So I think that um, that's one thing right off the bat that I see companies struggling with because you know I'm always in tune to the fact that performance has to be measured and managed. And I don't think it's being helped by people working remotely, but it's a reality that we have to contend with. So companies have to get good at that. I mean, I, I, I know that also in terms of integration and orientation of newer employees, there's challenges when people are working remotely. So we've got to get better at that as companies. And, and, I, and I think that um, there's, you know, there's a lot of unknowns out there. So I also think that companies are struggling with some of the planning. And I know that recruiting and firing and layoffs and a lot of things are on hold because everything still remains so topsy-turvy. Absolutely, you know, and that's really where a strong, we talked about what needs to be documented. So definitely how to document, how to document the interaction, but also a very strong onboarding process, a very strong training process has to be in place. So taking into account how you train somebody remotely, because if somebody, you know, you're hiring somebody, they can like in the, when we all work from the office, you can see what they're doing. If they have questions, they come to you, but here, you hire them the first day on Zoom, there can be two hours, but you're not gonna stand there for eight hours in, on Zoom talking to them. So you have to be prepared, et cetera. So that's also coming to play about how do we onboard? How do we hire? And I've done other podcasts in terms of hiring remote, like doing hiring via Zoom and remote interviews. So that's it's an very interesting- It's complicated. And I think that, that once they're hired, how do you manage that performance? How do you, beyond onboarding them, you know, we're, we're talking even about people that have been with you three, four, five years. You know, you, you see some people adapting really well and some not at all. And, 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 how do you, and how do you deal with that? Yeah, and that's something I think it will just evolve and we'll have to figure it out because it is the reality. You have to face it, right? I mean, this is what's happening. So, and, yeah. So you definitely, you do a lot of fast uh, speaking, you know, you speak in front of associations, in, in front of groups. What are the most uh, popular topics that people like you to talk about? Well, it's funny because, you know, there's a whole bunch of them. I'd say that uh, I've been speaking an awful lot remotely, especially uh, over the last year and a half about um, issues in, in the remote workspace. And one of the key issues that we see right now is, um, how do companies um, adopt the fact that it, domestically in the United States, you've got all these um, workers that are now working remotely in different states. So that's become a big issue for employers is that you know, you're, you've got um, uh, a 50 person company, let's say, and uh, you know, it used to be that you operated in two states, that your employees in your home state and maybe a remote one or two people somewhere else. Now suddenly that same company has people working in 10 or 15 different states. And there are some different complexities in some of these different states. And that becomes a challenge for companies too. So I've been speaking about that a lot recently. I think prior to that, I've been speaking a lot about the, the pandemic um, and, 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 and some of the, the safety issues, some of the vaccine issues, um, all, all, all sorts of things connected to performance management, leave issues. Uh, one of the things that's connected to something that we have talked about for years is paying people correctly because uh, measuring people's overtime, if they're entitled to overtime, becomes a real challenge when so many people are working remotely and you have the right systems. Are you getting the hours right? Um, but I think that there's, uh, uh, and then there's layoffs and furloughs and all, all the stuff that happened at the very beginning. Uh, but traditionally, if we're back to peacetime and things are working normally, um, one of the talks that I always found uh, interesting and was something I was doing um, a, a lot as, as um, I, I guess, 2019 and 18 um, was, um, and, I, and I hope to start doing it again soon, is something that we touched upon with values, which is how to fire high-performing yet toxic employees. 
And, and so to me, that's interesting. And, it, and it, it really does deal with documentation and deals with incorporating your values into your operating system. That was a big thing. I'm also, you know, um, like I said, preoccupied with companies staying ahead of the curve in terms of paying people correctly, being aware of discrimination issues, hiring and firing issues, how to fire people correctly in general, but also um, competition issues are always interesting to me too. So I talk a lot about um, um, uh, issues con concerning things like non-compete um, agreements, trade secret theft, people stealing company information. Mm. From other when they leave and what you can and can't do to stop that. Um, you know, I think once again, um, you know, as society returns back to normal, some of the more regular issues will be more regular occurrences. Absolutely. And we all hope it's going to be sooner than later. Yes, but it's going to be, you know, it's going to be modified. You know, the, the workforce is going to get modified for what direction it's going to go. We don't know. Where is it going to end up at? We don't know. But definitely, I think that is, even one more reason to have legal, to seek professional advice and not try to do it by yourself and trying to figure it out. I'm very big about staying in your lane and then hire professionals that high quality professionals that know what they're doing. And I know I'm not used, supposed to use the word experts, but I'm still, I'm, I'm, I can use yeah, it. Yeah, you can, I mean. That's right, it's, so it's, it's hire experts. Different. Yeah, hire experts that can help you. And I think, you know, what the knowledge that you share with us is, Incredible. I'm sure our listeners learned a lot. And just being aware of all those topics bring it to front of mind. And then you think, well, you know, yeah, that's an interesting topic. I don't know much about that. I probably should find out more because I might be violating it, right? Yeah, I think that, that the, you know, prevention is really the name of the game in my business. It really is. I mean, honestly, the thing about employment and labor law so many of the problems, it's really a human resources law, and so many of the problems um, are avoidable with just proper care, but it's hard to think that way because everybody's in the business of trying to make money and, and, and figuring out ways to survive. So some of those things slip, they slip through the cracks and they shouldn't. Absolutely. So like your subscription model would be a solution for that. So who, you, you still need to have an internal HR in order to be part of the subscription model? Or if a company does not have an HR, do you then substitute for that? How does that work? Well, we, we listen, the key thing is, is they've got to have a person that's de designated in the HR function in some capacity. Some companies are too small to, let's say, have a built out HR function. And if that's the case, we'll do the best we can and work with office managers or, or people like that that are performing that and at least let them be trained to be our eyes and ears. Um, and, and there's plenty of companies that are smaller that, that, that really do have CFOs, office managers, other people like that, that are performing it. It's not ideal and a uh, point in time will grow into having that, but honestly, um, we're there to support them on all the compliance questions that they have. Excellent. Yeah, and provide also the training, right? Well, the training, I, I think, goes hand in hand with the day-to-day -day advice because you know it's we're, we're often giving to day-to-day -day advice to one two or three key people and that's it but you know if we're able to effectuate some of our ideas to some of the managers um that are actually the ones that have more of the day-to-day -day access to the employees and could keep things reined in then that means a lot like frankly my theory has always been that it's a funnel approach Okay, so that managers are there to field complaints or see things that should be complaints and funnel them down to whoever's performing the HR function and then have that person within the HR function call somebody like us for advice on that. So within a day of something happening that the manager sees, we the lawyers see it as well. And then we're executing in real time. If that happens, that makes a big difference in averting problems. Absolutely. And that's why there you just delineated a process on how to handle complaints, right? Or how to manage because what the managers do, what the HR does, how it interacts with um, the lawyers, et cetera. So yeah. everybody has got to work as a team. Absolutely. Absolutely. So Joel, in closing, I know you, you do, um, I mean, I, I'm on your mailing list, so I get the mailings for, you do webinars, right? That people can attend. Absolutely. Absolutely. Good. 
and um, your website has a lot of information there by itself. So give me the, I mean, why don't you tell our listeners again, the name of your, how they can get to your yeah, website. Uh, listen, feel free to reach out to me if you want, if you want to be part of our, our universe uh, at jg at greenwaldllp.com. I love getting emails, that's fine. Um, or call us at 212-644-1310. Um, and that's, uh, and I'm Joel Greenwald and our firm is Greenwald LLP. It's Greenwald Doherty. It's the name of our firm. And the website is www.greenwaldllp.com. And um, listen, I want to thank you for uh, actually taking me out of my day a little bit to speak about something that's really passionate to me. And I really admire the work that you do. And I think it goes hand in hand with what we do. Thank you so much. And thank you for being a guest. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the System Simplified Podcast. We'll see you again next time and be sure to click subscribe to get future episodes.